evening, everyone. Let's go, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're in our third week uh, of, the, of our study of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew uh, chapters 5 through 7. Uh, and we'll be, um, we'll be talking this week, uh, moving on from the Beatitudes, which is the, the first sort of Jesus' like, initial pitch or um, his initial description of the character of the people who live in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and into uh, a discussion of, that Jesus gets into about what it means uh, for, uh, what his coming means for the law uh, and the prophets. What, what is he doing to the Old Testament? And this is a theme we're going to develop over the next few weeks, but it's, um, it, this is uh, a critical passage for us to understand kind of how the Old Testament turns into the new. Uh, Matthew is where the Old Testament, the Old Testament meets the New Testament. Like that's that's its purpose. In the, there's a reason it's where it's at in the the collection that we call the Bible, uh, and it's because especially this passage uh, that we're reading right now is where Jesus uh, he takes the law and he transforms it uh, and fulfills it and makes it something new. And we're going to start to talk about that this week. Uh, and really get into it next week when we enter into what are uh, called the, the antithesis. Um, those are the statements where Jesus says, uh, you've heard it said that law X, but I say Y, right? Always going beyond the requirements of what the law says. So uh, just a quick recap. Uh, as I said, we're on our third week. Um, I think Dominic and I were just talking about this being kind of the the center of what we believe. This, this three-chapter section of Matthew is probably the, the most important passage in the New Testament and maybe the most important passage in the whole Bible. Uh, Augustine, who is an early church father, he said, the seeds of all our faith are contained in this sermon. That this is it. If you can understand this, uh, you, you will understand what Jesus came to do and how he transformed the law into something that applies to all of us. Um, so first week I gave you four Greek words uh, that I won't go over again in detail, but uh, they were the idea of blessedness or flourishing, right, makarios, the idea of perfection or completeness, telios, the, I guess I'm going over them, I said I wasn't going to, but I am, uh, the kingdom of heaven, uh, which is a central concept in Matthew, and then finally, um, what was the fourth one, heart or center, cardia. Uh, right, for the Greeks. Like for us, we think of, uh, when we think it's in our brain and when we feel it's in our heart, but for them, the heart describes everything. All of that stuff happens inside of you and it's, it's in your cardia, your, that's your heart and your mind combined. Um, so a couple of conclusions from last week on the Beatitudes before we move into the new material. Um, first, we talked about the audience uh, uh, that the, the Sermon on the Mount is addressed to. And there were a few different, uh, few different options that we went over. One we rejected very quickly, and that's uh, one that was held by some of the early church fathers. That is, the Sermon on the Mount is really for like spiritual athletes or like, um, like really holy people, like monks or priests or uh, nuns, or right? It's for people who dedicate their lives uh, to the preaching and teaching of the word. That's who it's for. Well, the text doesn't really hold that idea. Like if you read it, it doesn't, that doesn't make a lot, it doesn't say that, right? It says it's for everybody. The reason you would want to make it only for super holy people or super people who think they're super holy uh, is because then you don't have to do it, right? <laughs> it's, very di it's very difficult to do. So people have been striving for years and years to figure out how it doesn't apply to them. Um, second group that it could be for is people who are already saved, uh, right? People who are, in, who are already disciples of Jesus, um, and it's, it's a, a call for them to build their character in a certain way. Uh, and then finally, it could be addressed to everybody. And I think the conclusion that makes the most sense, uh, but perhaps is the most difficult for us to unpack, is it's for everybody. What I mean by that is this. You, you've heard me describe the, there's kind of two spectrums or two arrows, an, an axis, right? Uh, there's, are you saved or are you not, right? Saved, not. And there's, are you virtuous? Or are you not, right? Are you not virtuous or are you virtuous? 
Um, and we, we spent, we, as uh, mainline evangelical modern Protestants, we spend a lot of time on this, right? Are you in or you out, right? No, nobody uh, goes to a revival. No, no preacher comes out of a revival or uh, a kid's camp or a vacation Bible school and says, I made a hundred, a hundred kids made a decision to be more virtuous, right? It doesn't happen. They say a hundred kids got saved, right? That's the, that's the measure of success for, for many uh, pastors, preachers, teachers. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that uh, although I'm drawing them as an axis like that, they're really not all that separated from one another. If, if you become a committed disciple of Christ, like you are, you're, you've moved up on this axis and you're in, you should, you should want this to mature. You should have a, a heartfelt desire to do the things that the people of the kingdom of heaven do. You, you won't always succeed, right? That's just a fact. Uh, we live in a broken world, and you living in a broken world partake of that brokenness, but your desire should be to, to, to become the kind of person who lives in the kingdom of heaven. Um, so the Beatitudes, uh, the second point I want to make here, these uh, Richard, I don't know what my points are, so maybe we can get them real quick. Uh, the Beatitudes, um, so they're, they're uh, the three views of these. One, there are entrance requirements. So you should seek to be mournful. You should seek to be, um, to be poor in spirit. You should seek uh, to thirst, after hun uh, uh, thirst and hunger after righteousness. Right? You should seek all those things. And, and that's an easy view to have if you are thinking of the audience of the sermon as like spiritual athletes. Right? And in fact, that's the early church view is, well, these are en we should all seek to kind of be penitent and uh, mourn over the sins of the world and, and reflective and, and all these things. Um, view two uh, is a description of character. And I, I think that's almost right. Jesus is uh, describing the kinds of people who are, are in the kingdom of heaven, right? The character of people who live in the kingdom of heaven. But I, I think the best one, and again, the hardest for us to unpack, is it's an invitation to wisdom. And we'll get into that as we go along here. But what G in the hands of the master, right? The law, the, the, um, the Old Testament law, it becomes wisdom. It becomes a, a guidance and uh, something that you should aspire to in a way of living your life that sanctifies you and makes you uh, into a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a, a, a future reality in this present age. And it, it's complex, but we're, we're going to get there slowly but surely. Um, so I, w I, want you to see, uh, I want you to see this as an invitation to wisdom. Now, I, I also want to step back for a moment. Now, J Jesus is a philosopher, Right, that's not, we don't usually think of him that way. But he's a guy, not a guy, he's, he's the Lord of the universe, but he's also a guy, right? And he uh, is in, uh, he's in first century Judea, he's collecting disciples, he's, he's having people around him that he's teaching, and they're seeking to emulate his way of life. The thing, they want to know his teachings and they want to emulate what he does. Uh, that, that's the basic description of a philosopher. Uh, and what we find in the Sermon on the Mount is the core of his teaching, right? This is how you're to live your life. Or th this is, he's describing the character that's necessary to obtain the good life. Uh, and there were, there were other people like this, right? Uh, the um, the uh, Roman emperor and philosopher, uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, he was a Stoic. Uh, and I, many of you have heard the phrase stoic as being like emotionless, like that's an a adjective we use. Um, but he, he was, there was a school of philosophy called stoicism, uh, and basically it centered around the idea that you, uh, you are only hurt when you believe that you are hurt. So um, you, you should control and master your emotions. Uh, you should not let people offend you. Uh, you should think of life as being short and as a, every day as a gift, right? And, and his, he, has a, he wrote a book called The Meditations, 
that if you read it is shockingly like the Sermon on the Mount, uh, except if you sucked all of the joy and uh, all of the desire for God and eternal things uh, out of the Sermon on the Mount, it'd be pretty similar, at least in format. You'd be like, oh, this is, this is familiar to me. Um, and you should read that book if you have time. It takes like an, a couple hours, um, and it's just a collection of sayings, and they're actually pretty good, um, like things that you can think about and apply to your own life in many ways. He, uh, his brother was what we would probably call an alcoholic, um, and at the beginning of the meditations, he writes, to my grandfather who taught me X, to my wife who taught me why, you know, he goes through a list of things that people in his life taught him, and he says, to my brother who taught me what not to do. I think that's, that's pretty clever. Some, everybody has something to teach you is kind of the philosophy. So anyway, re- returning to what Jesus is doing here, he's inviting us to wisdom. He's inviting us to, uh, in the Beatitudes, to become the kind of people that will live in the kingdom of heaven. So let's, let's go past the Beatitudes. And I have to confess here, I'm using somebody else's Bible. I forgot mine, so I stole this one out of Lost and Found. Um, so it's not mine. Uh, and if I go slowly, you'll know why. Um, thank you to Christina C. Lopez, uh, who received this on the 31st of October, 1999. Um, so we're going to start with verse 13. Actually, uh, let me say one last thing about the Beatitudes. Um, the, the last couple of verses there are directed as followers. It says um, in verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Notice what he's saying. Um, the, the character of the people of heaven right, is such that even in the midst of trials and tribulations, even in the midst of hungering after and not receiving um, mercy and, and justice and, and peace, that they have an eternal mindset, right, that they know, I, I may be poor in spirit here on earth, but the kingdom of heaven is mine, right, uh, right? that they know, I may be mourning now, but I'll be comforted, It may be weak to show mercy in this present evil age, but because I showed mercy, uh, uh, mercy will be granted to me, right? So it's, it's, um, think of the long view, right? Uh, If if you are a disciple of Christ, you know that this this is not all there is, right? There's a kingdom coming where justice rolls down like water, and that's in your mind, and you're trying to bring that place here. Uh, so when you face trials and tribulations, when you're persecuted for the sake of Christ, uh, it, which he says you will be, right? It doesn't say, well, maybe this will happen and maybe it will. No, he says you're, you will be persecuted because they persecuted the prophets. But keep these things in mind. Keep these principles in mind. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Okay, uh, verse 13. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, a couple things here. Your actions matter, right? Principle one, your actions matter uh, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It's not just about your character, right? When you have the the right character, when you have the the virtues uh, of the kingdom of heaven in mind, that will pour itself out in action. And he says, uh, right, that uh, I I love the three examples that he gives, right? He gives the example of salt, light, and a city, right? And, and you notice two things about the, and I, I guess a fourth one, which is the, the lampstand, um, or the candle. 
Um, keep in mind, uh, of those four examples, two of them, right? Uh, the, he says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden, right? And neither do men light a candle and then put it under a, a bushel, right, or in a basket, right? Because that'd be dumb, right? Why, why would you do that? The, that's not what a candle's for. And that's not what you're for as a disciple of Jesus, right? His, the, the idea is uh, if, if you are one of his followers, or if you are heeding the words of this sermon, you will yourself be compelled right, to be open uh, and to, to do good works in his name, right? To, to uh, let your, uh, your citizenship in the kingdom of heaven pour out of you like a running stream. People should see it. It should be a light that emanates from you. Um, the, the, the proudest moments of my life so far, um, well, you know, let's leave aside, um, you know, obviously the day I got married, the day I had kids, all that stuff. The, the proudest I have ever been of, of my kids is when people approach me and say, uh, man, your, your kids are, are different. They, they did something. Uh, you know, Chloe, uh, when she was a little kid, uh, she won like the Good Citizenship Award one day. And I was like, well, why is that? And uh, um, she had, uh, she was like in third grade or fourth grade and somebody had pushed a, a kindergartner down uh, and she had gotten the kindergartner up and, and had like took, t- taken her to a teacher and cleaned her up and made sure she was okay. Um, and I asked her what she did next, and she said, I went to look for the kid who hit her. Um, and I said, well, why'd you do that? Um, and she said, because that wasn't right. Um, and, you know, I, she didn't go beat the tar out of the kid or whatever, but um, it made me proud, right? Because the, the, the light of the kingdom burned within her, right? The, the desire for justice, the desire to make sure that that didn't happen to somebody else. Right? And I, at the time, she, she attributed that. She's like, well, we're Christians. We shouldn't let, that, we shouldn't let things like that happen. Amen. Um, that's the light that should burn within us. Um, the other metaphor here of salt is interesting for a bunch of different reasons, partially because nobody knows quite what it means. Um, it, it could just be salt. Um, and if you think about salt in the ancient world, uh, it was almost as important as water. Uh, do, do you want meat that's um, more than 30 minutes old? You better have some salt on hand um, because you, otherwise you can't preserve it, right? That's, that's how they, in an age with, uh, without ice boxes or refrigerators or Yeti coolers or whatever, they, they salted their meat in order to preserve it. So it's a preservative. Uh, it cleans and cleanses, right? It's, it, it makes things clean that weren't clean before. Uh, and it, it tastes good, right? It has savor to it. Uh, one of the explanations that I read, which I, I don't know that I quite believe, uh, is that, right, because it, it's not really possible for salt to lose its savor, right? Salt's a rock, so you can't use up its flavor. It just, you can ingest it, I guess. But uh, there was, there's speculation that salt is a reference to manganese, which is a chemical, like a chemical compound that you throw into fire and it causes the fire to come up, come up brighter. It burns off very quickly. Um, kind of like the, uh, the liquid stuff I put all over the campfire because I'm too, too lazy to, right, it, it makes it burn uh, more quickly. Um, and that can lose its potency, right? It, it can get old or break down and not be useful anymore. Uh, I don't know that, that I don't know enough to say um, whether that's true or not, but uh, whichever metaphor it is, it makes sense, right? If, if you think about the use of salt in food, it permeates everything once you use it, especially if you're using it to preserve. Um, we as Christians, right, we're, we're to serve a preservative function, right? We're to, um, we're to, to make things better in the world, right, to season it. Um, and we're to, um, like, th- that, that's the point, right, is that we're to, to uh, um, 
sorry, I'm losing my words here, but we're, we're essentially, right, to act as the salt of the world, uh, or the salt of the earth. Um, and there's a warning here too, right? Like if you're, not, if you're not really into this, that's a problem, right? From, from a discipleship perspective, he's saying, if you lose your savor, what's gonna, what do you think will happen to you? What, where do you think you are on this spectrum and this spectrum? All right. Um, so that's, you know, oh, and then principle two is what you do, do to glorify the Father, right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Well, one of the things that we're going to uh, talk about a little bit later is Christ's instruction that people should, um, he says, when you do your prayer, when you say your prayers, say them in your closet. Don't do them loudly in front of men to be seen of them. When you give alms, don't, don't go out and give a bunch of money to, to, to people so that people can see you doing that. Um, and that sometimes that seems to be in conflict with this, right? The idea that you should do good works in front of people, attribute them to the Father, glorify the Father. And when we get to that section, we'll talk about it more. But I, I think the distinction is the motivation, right? Uh, if, if um, in fact, he even says, you know, if you do things so that you can be praised by people, well, I mean, their praise is your reward, right? There's not, there's not more to it than that. Um, but when you do things to glorify the Father, right, the Father sees what you did and he glorifies you. That's the idea. So as, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, it's not just our job to have a certain type of character. It's to, it's a, it's to let it, that pour out into action. All right. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time on the next passage. Uh, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. And th this is probably the central passage in the whole, uh, the whole sermon. Like it, it reveals Jesus' purpose and colors everything that comes after it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I want you, if you write in your Bible, uh, underline fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments until, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But who, whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, if you're in the audience um, of this sermon, it, it, this last verse probably brings a, a great wave of despair over you. What hope do you have? The, the Pharisees are the good guys. They're the ones who obey the law, right? And, and strive to obey the law as fully as ever they can. Um, so if, if you have to exceed their righteousness, you're probably like, I, this guy is... Right, he already told me that his kingdom is full of sad, mourning, poor, you know, wretched, persecuted people, um, and then he told me to even get in. Right, I have to be, I, I, like, I have to be better than the the Pharisees. So, I, I don't. And Jesus is right; he's developing an idea here, um, which he started to develop in verse seventeen. The reason I had you underline fulfill is because. As I told you last week and the week before, fulfillment is the key concept, or one of the key concepts of the whole book of Matthew, right? He, his purpose is to show that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament scriptures, it, right? He starts out by saying, Jesus is the king, right? Because he traces the lineage of Jesus uh, all the way from David, right, to, to the the then present day, and says Jesus has, has a claim as a messianic king. Right, so that's very clear. And then he gives us uh, uh, indications that Jesus is like Moses. Right? Jesus is the prophet like Moses who's going to come. So he's, he's just going through and he's just checking the boxes. Right? He's like, oh, he's a king. Also, he's a prophet like Moses. Um, and there are, there are 15 places in Matthew where Matthew says... Uh, event X happened so that Y would be fulfilled. Um, and there are a couple of ways of reading these. Um, 
some of them are very easy, right? Like the prophet said that something would happen, and then in Matthew it happened. And Matthew says, see, it happened. But not all of them. Um, and so it, it makes sense for us to ask the question, what, what does it mean for a prophecy to be fulfilled? We're going to read five of these with their Old Testament uh, correlations. So go to Matthew 1, 22, if you would. And actually, uh, I'm sorry, Richard, I'm going to read just, just a bit up there. Um, verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, and we all know this nativity story, but then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So uh, if, you have your, uh, if you have a little note there, you can see that that is in Isaiah 7.14, which I will turn to. This is Isaiah del delivering a message uh, to the king or to uh, Ahaz, who's the king of, of uh, uh, the king of Judea, and he says, seven fourteen. Uh, and actually, let's go to verse ten. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, uh, unto Ahaz, saying, "Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above." So Ahaz is thinking of allying himself with another kingdom. He wants, to make a, he wants to make an alliance with another kingdom to, to fight off the Assyrians who are coming. Um, and uh, the Lord speaks to Ahaz through Isaiah and says, uh, ask for a sign and God will give it. And God will show you. Uh, and Ahaz says, well, I wouldn't want to do that um, because I don't want to tempt the Lord. Well, Ahaz doesn't care about the Lord. He, he's... he's He's being silly. Um, and he, it says, and uh, verse 13, it says, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? So uh, God through Isaiah is saying, I I'm getting real tired of this. Uh, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall uh, call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. But before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So uh, it's, it's an indication to Ahaz that a child will be born. Before that child can grow all the way up, the two kings that you're afraid of, they'll both be dead. Right? It's the, so this is a specific prophecy for Ahaz. It, it, it doesn't doesn't have much to do with a coming Messiah, right? Now, later on, it, it goes on and says, the government will be on his shoulders, they'll call him wonderful, mighty counselor, you know, and so forth. Um, and so you get, the, you get the, the sense that it is something different than just a prophecy to Ahaz. But um, do, do you notice anything, anything um, strange about that verse um, and the way it's fulfilled, right? So Matthew says... All these things happen so that it'll be fulfilled. And then the, the passage is, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, is, which being interpreted is God with us. Anything strange about how, how Jesus fulfills that? Well, his name's not, they don't name him Emmanuel. Right? They don't, they don't say, Oh, well, well, to fulfill his prophecy, we'll, we'll name him Emmanuel. They name him Jesus, or Yeshua. Um, so whatever fulfilled in Matthew's mind means and in the literary strategy of Matthew, it, it doesn't always mean the exact, the exact thing that was uttered in the Old Testament happens in the New. It, it, it can be transformative. It can be different. It, it's more complex than saying, 
Isaiah said X would happen and Y did. So that's number one. Uh, let's go to Matthew 2, 5 through 6. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem, uh, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes, this is the verse before, of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. This is Herod. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Um, and that's from Micah 5.2. We're not going to turn to it, uh, although Richard can probably display it. Uh, it says the exact, the exact thing I just read. Um, so that, that's a pretty clear example, right, where, where a, a prophet said something would happen, and then it happened, right? It, it, that it might be fulfilled, what the prophet said, and the prophet said the exact, th the exact thing that, that came to happen. So let's go to Matthew 2.15, which is our next verse, our next fulfilled passage. Uh, and we'll go to 14. And when he arose, this is Joseph, uh, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, say, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. So let's go to Hosea 11.1, 1, which is where that's from. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Well, is that about, is that about Jesus? Is that a prediction about Jesus? No, it's a description of the Exodus. Right? So J Jesus is in this, pro in this, he's fulfilling this prophecy by standing in the place of Israel. Right? It's, it's figurative. It's not literal. Um, Matthew 2, 16, the next verse says, Then Herod, uh, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, uh, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. So this is even, this is like one order of magnitude greater in terms of being figurative, right? It's, it's saying, um, right, there's this passage about Rachel who's kind of the, uh, a stand-in for like, all the women of Israel weeping over the lost men of Israel. Right, and and so uh, it would be like I don't know. I'm trying to think of an, a modern. Uh, if we were to have an example here in the United States, it'd be like B Betsy Ross weeping over the flag, or or something. Like some cultural touchstone that we have, where you're like creating a figure and then saying it's like that was happening. So e even more complex, or even higher level in terms of of how this passage fulfills the Old Testament. And then finally, Matthew 2, 23. Um, and this one says, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Uh, this does not appear anywhere in the Old... Th that phrase or any variation of it do not appear anywhere in the Old Testament. He, he shall be called a Nazarene. So we, we don't know what necessarily 100% what Matthew was talking about. There is one possibility. If you can go to Isaiah 111, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Um, the word for branch is Nazar. Um, so uh, Nazareth means something like city of sticks or st stick town, something like that. Um, and so the, the thought is, uh, it can, right, it, that, that, that verse, right, where it talks about a branch coming out of the stump of Jesse, right, the, the remnants of the line of the kings, that, that's a reference uh, to Nazareth. Um, but it, the, nowhere does the phrase, he shall be called a Nazarene, nowhere, nowhere does that appear in the Old Testament or anywhere else in our Bible. 
So people have wondered for years, what, what, what does it mean that, that this fulfills this thing we can't find? Um, so I want, want you to hold in your mind as we go through the antithesis next week and as we start to talk about um, what it means for Christ to have, right? He says he didn't come to get rid of the, the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them. Well, that uh, fulfill means is very complicated concept in Matthew. It means more than I came to uh, like fulfill some prophecy about the law, right? He, he came, and, and here's, here's what I think it means, uh, or what I will propose that it means, and then we will study to it in the next few weeks. Um, what it means is he came to deepen them and transform them into something new. The, the law is not abrogated. It's not gone. It, it doesn't disappear because Jesus came. That, that's not what he came to do. In fact, he, he says, not one stroke of the pen will disappear until everything is fulfilled. Till the end of time, the law will remain. The law is obligatory. But, and then you might say, well, okay, Jesus, but what about grace and love and what you did on the cross? And it, He's transforming the law into something we can live by, something that shapes our character as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. For the Old Testament, and uh, we're going to study this a whole lot more in the weeks to come, Paul understood this. He writes in Galatians 3.23, right, and he's confronting people who, uh, they are new Christians, and these these Judaizing forces, uh, that's the Scholars call them Judaizers, his like opponents at the church in Galatia. They are people who want Christianity to be fundamentally more Jewish, fundamentally more legal. That's what they want. And so they're teaching the people in in Galatia all about this. They're saying, oh, you know, you have to follow the law. You got to eat kosher. You got to do all, you know. And Paul is giving an explanation of why the law continues to exist, but is covered by Christ's grace, right? And he said, uh, why, the question is, well, why did the law exist at all? And he answers that by saying, the law was your schoolmaster. Your, uh, in, uh, in Greek, it's pedagogos, right? Your, uh, a, a, a pedagogos was a, a slave that you would hire, uh, an educated slave that you would hire as a, a householder who would um, get your kids up and teach them uh, and kind of be responsible. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, not to have a slave, but to have somebody responsible for your kids that you don't have to deal with, right? Um, but like that, that person was in charge of your kids. You were not, you, you, you had discharged your duty to your children by, by purchasing a slave that would do these things. And, and typically they could read and write in several languages. They were very intelligent people. Uh, and uh, they would tutor your kids for you that was, their, that was their whole existence. Uh, Alexander the Great, his, his um, tutor was Aristotle, who's the philosopher. Um, so what Paul means when he says that, right, the law was your schoolmaster, right, it, it taught us about sin, right? It, uh, by observing the law, you could understand the character that God wanted, but observance of the law was never enough in itself. We're going to get into this next week, but you know, if we were to go back to Isaiah, you would see that, that God's main complaint against the children of Israel isn't, you're not following the law. It's, you don't mean it. <laughs> right? He says, you offer me sacrifices, and you go to the temple, and you, you, uh, you, you follow the letter of the law that's provided in Leviticus. Deuteronomy and the, the, the books of the law, but your heart's not in it. You, you don't really believe in me. You don't, you, you and, and um, there, there's a wonderful passage where, where God kind of upbraids them and he says, do you think that I eat the flesh of bulls? Do, do you think I eat this stuff that you're leading? I don't. It, the, the point is you are, are, uh, you are, living, you are to live a life where the, the rhythms of your observances are, they form a character that respects me as God. 
right? That, that knows who I am and what I want for you. So, uh, like, that, this idea, right, that your, your inward heart should be reflected on the outside, that idea of teleos or perfection, right? That, that's what he means when he says your perfection has to surpass that of the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. Right? And he says later on, you, you, you be, per, be perfect as your father is perfect. He doesn't mean be perfect like God is perfect. Like perfect in a moral, like, like you, you, you don't do anything wrong. Right? That's impossible. We would all fail. What he means is be whole. Be the same on the inside as you are on the outside. Um, what else do I have here? And then finally... Um, uh, we're going to talk about this a bunch next week because we're going to get into these, these passages where he says, you've heard it said X and I say Y. But what he's going to start doing here is tracing out the ways in which um, various commandments right, from, from the Old Testament uh, are, are actually a, a guide to virtue. Right? He says, don't, don't think of the command to kill as, or the command not to kill, um, as, as a sign that says don't think of it as a way for you to develop uh, a, a virtuous heart, I, I, a virtuous heart that doesn't even develop anger, unjust anger at your brother. Um, that probably the most famous antithesis is the one where he says, you've heard it said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. Uh, and that, that, should, that should create a stab of panic and fear uh, in everybody here, probably. Right? If, if that's the standard that you have to meet. But, but what God's saying, or what, what Jesus is saying is, you have to become the kind of person, right, who understands not... You, you can say, oh, I didn't commit adultery, or I didn't kill anybody. But if you have the kind of character that you should have, if you're developing virtue as a, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you, you won't even get near that, right? You, you, will, you will develop a spirit of love and dignity and considering other people um, as the image of God in, in a way that reflects God's love and your love for your neighbor, the two things upon which all the law and all the prophets hang. Um, so I'm, I'm hitting right now uh, 45 after, uh, and I have found that I lose people after about 45 minutes, even though Richard said I could go on and on if I wanted to. Um, I'm going to stop, uh, and next week we'll get into the antithesis and talk about those. Um, I really can't, uh, really can't stress enough that, that uh, this idea of the law being transformed into something new uh, is so central to what Jesus did and taught. Um, like if, if you can come away with that idea that this passage takes uh, the, the raw material of the law and turns it into an ethic that we should all live by, uh, it's beautiful. It really is. So with that, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much, God, for um, just giving us the opportunity to get together, Lord, and to learn from your word. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with us uh, in the weeks and months to come, uh, and that, Lord, you'll give us... Uh, uh, the wisdom to discern the character that we ought to develop and pursue uh, as your followers uh, as we act as salt and light in the world. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.